Great. Thank you so much, Candice. Uh, thank you, Linux Foundation, for having us. I um, want to say thank you to the audience. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world today. Uh, with My name is Mike Reynolds. I'm the, as Candice mentioned, I'm the product marketing manager for at NetApp. And with me today is the brilliant uh, Dan Stern, who's one of our solution engineers. And today we're going to talk a little bit about open source and choosing the right management strategy for your open source deployments. So with that said, let's go ahead and get into it a little bit and kind of talk over what our agenda is going to be for, for the next 30 minutes or so. So we'll start off with, with some basics, talking a little bit about what the advantages of open source are. I don't think we'll spend a whole lot of time there because I think most of the, this audience probably is well aware of what those advantages are. Uh, but we just want to touch base with those just to, as sort of a check-in. And then we'll talk about the challenges. And and hopefully, you know, not hopefully, but you might be running into some of these challenges yourself. And so we can kind of level set there in terms of, you know, what, what are the issues you might be running into as you deploy, as you run and manage on an ongoing basis your, your open source technologies and your open source stack. And then we'll we'll get into kind of what your options are are in in terms of managing that open source. Um, you know, do you, do you do it yourself? Do you bring in uh, another organization to help you manage it? Do you do something sort of in between where you've got software tools? We'll talk about what those options are and you know what what maybe to help you formulate what the right path is for you. And then we'll get into some examples of where you know Dan has has some hands-on experience with helping some of our customers with their open source environments, and and talk a little bit about what they're doing, and 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 talk a little bit about what the benefits they're seeing and they're recognizing as they have used our technology or our expertise to help them with that. And then, of course, we'll give you some more links where you can go find help. You can sign up for a demo or, or, and the like. So that's kind of the agenda for today. So I guess with that said, let's. Let's get into it. So Dan, um, I, as I mentioned before, I think most of this audience kind of understands what the advantages of open source are, but maybe you could review for them a little bit what 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 you think those are and, and what we're seeing. Sure. So basic reason people usually start looking at open source is usually economics because uh, true open source solutions are available to use without paying anybody. So that's usually the draw. And then um, in addition to that, you have the ability to both influence and even contribute to the future of that technology. So you can become part of the community and you can help decide what the priorities are and help guide it to the things that are most meaningful for your business. Yeah. And as this the statistic there says, you know, a lot of a lot of the Fortune 500, almost all of it is really uh, using open source. So it's it's pretty prevalent and we're seeing it in most enterprises that we step into. Okay, so those are the advantages at a very high level. What are some of the challenges that you're seeing out there, Dan? So we're highlighting three here that are that are pretty common. And the first one's the first one for a reason. Uh, these technologies tend to be very sophisticated and they solve really big problems, but they're not simple. And finding people that are really uh, have the experience and expertise to make them hum and sing and do all the right things for your organization can be challenging not just to find them once, but to keep them around, right? So do you have the number of people you need in the right geographies, time zones, you know, uh, times of year, all that stuff uh, all the time, or are you having to, you know, replace them kind of continuity of expertise, I might say. So that's a big one. And maybe the biggest one. Uh, secondarily, Clearly, we have to fit all of the ways that we're using these technologies into the way we use everything, right? Into our IT landscape and the standards uh, and regulations that we have to abide by in terms of security and compliance. So that's an important consideration. Uh, for example, there are financial services companies that say we absolutely support and can use open source, but they are required to have a third party that backs them up because one of the issues with dealing with an open source solution is there's no vendor on an SLA to help you, right? There's a community that does it when they agree, when they have time, when they see the same urgency, but uh, that's not always enough for some organizations. And then thirdly, very related to that, um, is it's very difficult to find the, the support that you might need, particularly if you're using multiple different technologies and you're trying to consolidate that, that support. So it isn't that hard to find somebody that'll help you on a technology. That's relatively easy to do. But if you're using three or four or five or a dozen, it can be very difficult to find somebody. And now you're in, how many vendors do I have? How many different processes? You know, are there different SLAs? Are there different standards of support? It can get complicated quickly. 
Um, and so many people look for are there ways to consolidate at least some of that support? Yeah. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. Uh, that, that lack, lack of expertise piece is I think common for a lot of, a lot of high tech industries, right? Not only finding those people that really have the, that knowledge, but keeping them around and retaining them, as you mentioned, it's, that can be tough. People want to move up. They want to do new, new jobs. They, they get bored sometimes and they want to move on and just retaining that talent is a challenge. So yeah, that makes sense that uh, that 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 uh, our our customers and the market at large is kind of seeing that as as kind of one of their top top priorities and top challenges. Okay, so there's a lot of options out there. Let's talk about how some folks how your what what the market kind of is offering right now in terms of how people are managing open source technologies. What you're seeing there. What what are people's options really? Yeah, and there's there's sort of a spectrum of options. So we've we've put a couple of bullets here to to talk through it, but they're not always completely distinct. But here goes. <laughs> so the first one is obviously you can hire people and do it. You know, you can yeah. you can build or hire or buy the expertise within your organization, and you can handle it. Um, and that's a very viable option. That's that's part of the ethos really of open source, and it should be it, you should be able to do that, right? Because there's no vendor that's forcing you to buy something or that's retaining certain IP, so that you can't be you know completely successful if you you know don't work with them. Um, that's part of the point of an open source project. So one option is to do it by yourself. There's a second that's a little bit of a hybrid, which is you may turn to a to a cloud provider who can give you an environment to play with and they can kind of help you with the day one, right? Stand it up, make it available. And then you can do the DIY version of, you know, paying for it, or I should say managing it and caring for it, keeping it healthy and available and working and architecting it and changing it over time yourself. So that's kind of day one help from one of the cloud providers, day two on your own kind of a DIY model. And that's one that, that I think is fairly prevalent as well. The, the next option is there are companies who provide solutions, technologies that are analogous to and sometimes based on the open source solution, but they are selling software. So they are selling a solution that is, is related to the open source project. Uh, you have to license that. So the economics are very different. If the a company that's offering that has created killer features that are exactly what you need for your use case and you know really adding value to the way that you're going to consume that solution this is completely viable it it does technically break the open source model you're not using an open source technology anymore you're using a proprietary technology but again if the economics work for you and the things that that company has built are really valuable then you might choose to buy them um, and that's what we mean by commercialized or, or, and it's really not open source, you know, to, to be semantic there. And then the third one is there are companies that offer a managed service. So they will help you with both day one and day two um, and really give you the expertise, you know, as an outsourced service so that you can consume it. So that's very similar to, you know, looking at other SaaS solutions or other platforms where, Rather than installing it, configuring it, you know, managing it, updating it, patching it, dealing with security vulnerabilities, you give all that burden to somebody else and you just use it and you rely on them to keep it available and working for you. Um, so that's sort of the spectrum, anywhere from kind of do it your, your, yourself, soup to nuts, all the way through outsource essentially the whole thing and just consume it. Right. So I'm thinking about that kind of that middle ground where you may, maybe you're looking at the hybrid model. And I think one of the things to to make sure we kind of, and make sure I get this right, Dan, but if I'm going to take that commercialized option, um, I've got to think about not only maintaining, you know, paying for maybe the management of it, the service piece of it, but also that that software component too, that that ongoing cost there, right? Is that kind of how yeah. it seems? Yeah, you're, you're buying those features. There's there's yeah. no two ways around that, right? So you're buying them. And again, that that's... Um, while it breaks the open source model, it is a completely valid <laughs> commercial option, right? You have to decide whether or not it works, whether or not the, right. the price that they're charging and the capabilities that they're bringing to market are worth it. Um, no different than you would buying any other software. So it it does um, deviate from the whole point of open source. But, right. you know, I don't think anybody's in the business to to be a purist for the sake of being a purist, right? The question is, what does your organization need and what are your business requirements and That's what's right. the best way to meet them? Yep, yep. Uh, how do I serve the business the best is, is I guess, the real question that you want to ask there. Sure. Excellent. So let's move on here. All right, so 
we've heard about we've heard about the do it yourself. There's kind of the hybrid model, or or maybe using a cloud provider to manage your open source. Um, there's the fully managed piece. We're doing this webcast for a reason. Uh, tell us a little bit about what what NetApp's doing and uh, and and some of the maybe the advantages that we we have and we brought to bear with our customers. Yeah, so we we've chosen a set of open source capabilities, open source technologies, really focused at the data layer. So think about databases and streaming and search and some of the core data capabilities, which are obviously very close to the heritage and expertise of NetApp overall. Uh, and we offer some managed service for them. Um, that is that third option, right? Where you can just sort of give us the keys and we'll take care of it for you. We're responsible for all the care and feeding and making sure it's available and working and scaling and efficient for you. Um, and that's one of the options that you have. However, our core competency, I would argue in many ways is really expertise. So you see on the left here, you know, we have a ton of experience doing this, right? Over 330 million node hours of managing these technologies for our customers. Um, and that team is available in many different ways to support uh, organizations wherever they are on their journey. So the managed service is one option. Uh, another option is support. Some companies uh, don't want us to give us the keys and have us run it for them, but do want expert access, excuse me, to our experts. The kind of extreme example of that is if you're running a dark site, you know, by definition, nobody can punch in and help you manage anything. That's the point of having a dark site, right? It is unavailable to everybody else, but you may want the ability to reach out to those experts and get some help. And so that's another offering that we have, which is just support where we don't actually touch the solution for you, but we give you access to the experts. And as a footnote, those experts are the exact same people that are running it in our managed service. So sometimes they're answering a question for somebody where they are physically managing that technology and other times for somebody that's reaching out and has a question, but we don't have access to their environments. But same people, same level of expertise and experience. We also provide some consulting. So if, if folks are looking at project-based work where they need access to those kinds of experts to help them evaluate, architect, troubleshoot, design, fix, change, or just make efficient the way that they're using these technologies, we do that as well. So a good way just to summarize that is we'll meet you where you are in your life cycle. If you're in the early days of figuring out if you're going to use it and how, we can help there. If you're a more mature user, but you want to figure out if having somebody else run it for you is a better economic and, and risk adverse uh, model, we can talk to you about that. Um, but fundamentally, it's our expertise that I would say is kind of the centerpiece of our offerings. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I noticed that uh, you know one of the one of the challenges where we we talked about earlier is folks are that are that have multiple different open source technologies in their environment. They're needing to find people or 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 organ other organizations that provide service, and those organizations may only provide uh, expertise on one one flavor of open source. And I think one of the things that we do pretty well here is we really touch all well, not all of them, but a. a a large host of of different open source technologies that we really have expertise across, and that shows up there on the slide on the right hand side. Yeah. And then yeah. another uh, quick point I'll make, Dan, and I'll flip it back to you, is that the capability to really do this on any cloud that 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 uh, that a uh, organization is looking for. Certainly, the major clouds that are out there, or you know, a lot of folks are bring. We're seeing some movement of workloads coming back on prem in some cases, uh, but that capability to do this either in the cloud or on prem. Yeah, so you make a great point. Um, we, we absolutely do do it anywhere. And the reason is we're just about making people successful with these technologies. Right. So we, we're not trying to lock them in. Like the only reason that you stay with our offerings is that you're being successful with technologies and the economics make sense. So our incentive is to prove our value and our worth every day, make sure that it's working well and that you're successful. Um, where you do that, if you're in a cloud provider, if you're on-prem, if you're both, if you're moving things around, doesn't really matter because the open source technologies are not tied to any particular deployment model. You can download them and put them wherever you'd like. Um, so we provide that kind of um, flexibility to move it around portability uh, between those different offerings. But I also wanted to mention, you, you said there's a bunch at the top there. In fact, it's not all of them. So we should mention that. Yeah. Yes, we, we do have a set of technologies at the data layer that we support. And in fact, we're adding more. Um, we'll talk about that in one of our customer stories, but you know, our business model is to expand that where it makes sense for both us and our customers. And so, you know, we don't do everything. We can't 
can't claim to do every technology there is, but um, we are positioning ourselves as a provider that can help with multiple technologies and simplify vendor relationships and give you the same quality of service across different technologies. Yeah. And as some of these technologies change and become not open source anymore, um, <laughs> new technologies kind of come come into play. We can't talk about too much about that right now. It's a little off topic, but that happens too. And those new well, technologies sometimes get supported as well. We can, yeah, we can certainly say that we support literally uh, Valky, which is probably right. the one you were thinking about. And that's uh, one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's part of what we do. Very similar to years ago when the change happened with uh, Elasticsearch and OpenSearch, and right. we are uh, in support of open search and offer solutions around that. You see that, that uh, icon there. So absolutely. We, we do stick with the o true open source version. Yep. Yep. Sounds great. Okay, cool. So let's talk about this in practice. Now we've got customers that had a, you know, we've seen some really, I think pretty tremendous uh, gains, some benefits that they've, they've experienced. Let's talk a little bit about some of our customer experiences if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. So this first one is just a good example of uh, sometimes with these complicated, sophisticated technologies, it can be hard to make them dance, right? And do the things you need them to do. So this was a company that reached out because they were using Cassandra within their within their environment, but they were having a bad user experience, right? The users were waiting too long for the system to come back and, uh, and answer questions or, or respond. Uh, in an unacceptable way. So they reached out and we jumped in to help them understand how to optimize their platform, how to change the way that Cassandra was configured and the way the application was interacting with it. And in this case, reduce their latency from about 16 seconds. You know, in this day and age, you can imagine you hit enter, 16 seconds seems like forever. Like you're off and doing three other things by the time that ends, right? Yeah. Uh, down to less than a second, right? So really making that much more efficient and, and most importantly, making the user experience uh, good. Um, they also, based on our expertise and the way that that we could help them, uh, moved over to use our managed service. So now we are running it for them and keeping it optimized and keeping it healthy and efficient and running for them um, and keeping their users help, happy, happy, excuse me. Yeah, as a, con uh, as a consumer of many things, uh, I'm probably not going to stick on someone's website for 16 seconds <laughs> after I hit the buy button. Yeah, you got to really want buy it. But no, you got to really want it, right? And I probably don't want it that bad. I'm just not that patient. So um, it, I can see there's business. There's a business outcome that's maybe not so positive if you've got to if you have to wait that long. Right. I was going to say, you know, if it's Taylor Swift tickets for your kid, maybe you wait that long. But in the business uh, world, not, right? that, that's a nightmare I don't want to revisit. But <laughs> it was actually my wife had to, but that's another story. We'll 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 talk about that later. Okay, let's move on. Uh, another another story here. If I can make the slides work, there we go. Uh, tell us about this one. Um, I think there was a, a competitor that we uh, that we had run into on this one, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, this is an interesting story. So this is a company that had a solution that included uh, both Cassandra and Kafka within their environment. Um, and they were buying one of those commercialized versions of Cassandra, and they um, had a contract with their third with their customer, right? Um, and because of the inefficiencies of how the data was being managed and stored, their margins were getting squeezed. It was becoming more and more expensive to support the solution, but they were on a fixed contract with their customer, so they were just feeling the pressure on their margins uh, as they continued to execute on their contract. So they turned to us and said, can you help us optimize that? And what we found was we could not only save them licensing costs in this case, right? So it'd get off the commercial version and onto yeah. the true Apache Cassandra version, but also make it more efficient in terms of how the system was performing and how it was storing data and save them a bunch of money. In fact, we saved them so much money that they were able to move to use our consulting and our support for both products for less than what they were spending on just the proprietary version of Cassandra. So the economics here were fantastic for them, right? They improved their margins and improved how much expertise they had and, and what kind of support and help they got. Um, you know, that's that's a win-win, right? If you can pay less and get more, we would all do that. Uh, so a really good example in this case, just the context is it was a contract, so they couldn't just walk away, right? They needed to continue to support their customer and we were able to help them do that in a very efficient way. Right, six hundred thousand dollars, nothing to uh, sneeze at for most organizations. Yeah, great. Okay, let's. Uh, I think we have one more example here. I think this was DoorDash, in fact, um, and I know they had multiple open source technologies that we were 
working with on, on this case. So you can tell us a little bit more about that, Dan. Yeah, I'll, I'll assume that everybody knows who DoorDash is. Well, that's probably an assumption. I'm sure not everybody knows who DoorDash is. <laughs> so DoorDash, um, at the heart of it, is a delivery service typically focused on food. And uh, technology is in many ways their business, right? So when you place an order, are browsing around for options, are waiting for your things to arrive, and are waiting for the messages to tell you that it's you know, it's in the car and it's on the way and all that, uh, that's the lifeblood of their business. That customer experience is, is critical to them. And they use a lot of open source technology. You can see a number of things there, Cassandra, Kafka, open source, Postgres. Um, and they turned to us because we specifically could help them across that gamut, right? It wasn't just a vendor that said, I can help you with Kafka only, but we can help you with a bunch of these things. As our relationship has grown with them and with other customers, they sometimes turn to us and say, can you add another technology? We really like your service. We like uh, the way that you support it and the expertise that you bring to bear. Can you consider adding another one? And in this case, we did. Uh, that's Cadence, which is an orchestration tool um, that, that they use. And uh, in fact, we're looking at another one, which we'll be able to announce here in the not too distant future. But that's part of how we work with customers, right? We look at both our customers and what they're interested in, as well as uh, the market and where it makes sense. We continue to expand the portfolio of technologies that we support. Um, the last thing I'll say about this, and, and if you have any questions, great, is you know this is their company, right? I mean, we're talking about the technologies that drive their entire business model. So their customer experience, their uptime, the SLAs that we support, and you can see it's across a very large estate, you know, this is it, right? They they partner very closely with us because if this stuff falls over, it's a huge issue for their entire business. Um, and so, you know, it's a it's a terrific partnership and one that we value very much and love seeing their success as they continue to grow. One of the most interesting moments was we were already working with them when when COVID hit. Uh, you might imagine their business went way up, right? They had to scale very rapidly in a lot of ways, and we were able to help them do that effectively. So a terrific. Uh, Terrific success story for us and for them. Yeah, yeah, it's a good story. There's the 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 multiple open source technologies element to this. There's the there's the very stringent SLAs and uptime that they require. Um, there's the size and scope of of the environment. You know, we've got it listed here, twenty two hundred nodes. I'm sure that's growing too at some level. Um, so just the sheer scale of of kind of delivering this for them across open source, I think is it's been great for us and good for, very very great for them too. So. Excellent. Great. So key takeaways, Dan, let's review. Yeah. So, so just to simply uh, summarize here, uh, we believe deeply in uh, open source. We're also an Linux foundation uh, presentation. So I think we probably have an audience that does, and we certainly know the foundation does, um, but there are some challenges to, to success, right? There are some things that you have to work out in order to really get the value out of these technologies. And as we talked about, you have a lot of options. You can do it yourself. You can turn to vendors, you can turn to commercial versions, you can do hybrids. Um, all of those are, are the right answer in some circumstances. So it's really important to understand that. We find that a lot of customers tend to go with the first thing they learn about because they don't understand the whole landscape. So it's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this, this, uh, this seminar was to say, you have options, you should know about all of them before you make an uninformed choice, right? And decide what fits your business. And then thirdly, of course, we have some expertise and services that we offer, uh, and we would be happy to chat with folks if that seems like a, an appropriate possibility. Absolutely. And I th think if I could forward this. We're a technology company. Did we say that yet? <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, we might've mentioned that. Uh, a couple of, of things people can do to follow up, and I think we'll drop the links into the, the Q&A section too. Just... Why don't you tell us a little bit about what people can do to follow up, Dan? Yeah. So the free trial, um, you can actually go to instacluster.com. There's a link that we put in the chat um, and you can, you know, just go there and uh, and actually provision a cluster of whichever of these technologies uh, you want to try out for free and play with it. Um, what you'll see is it's very easy. Basically, all the technologies, you can get a working cluster that you connect to and use in less than 10 minutes. So it goes very quickly. Uh, there's a lot of value there on kind of the day one operations. You know, what are all the things I need to download and configure and what options do I need to take and how do I make sure that the networking is set up and how do I figure out how to connect to it after? We try to make that easy because we want people to, to take advantage of these open source technologies. Um, so that's kind of a day one trial. I mean, 
we are running it in the background for you and you can certainly continue to use it. Uh, I believe it's a 30 day free trial um, and get a sense for whether or not the value is there. But again, the real value that we deliver is really beyond day one. I mean, we help on day one, but day two is where we really shine, right? Keeping it healthy and working for a very long time. So yeah. you'll get a taste of that if you want to look at it. And then the other option is just reach out. And if you have questions or a project or you want to get our perspective, uh, we're happy to just, you know, have a chat with you, get on our webinar, get on a Zoom or a Teams or whatever it might be, talk through your project, see whether or not we can help, give you some ideas, maybe point at some things and resources that might help you. Um, that's the business we're in, right? We we like helping people and and helping people understand how to be successful with these technologies. And then, you know, if our services make sense, happy to chat about those. Um, and so if anybody just wants to have a chat or explore a little bit, we'd be more than happy to uh, to engage. Sounds good. And I think we are to our Q&A section now. And we do have some questions in the queue. Uh, okay. So it says here, Dan, it says we lean. And I think we, we talked about this a little bit, but uh, this question might have come in uh, earlier, but let's go ahead and answer it anyway. It says we lean uh, to the do-it-yourself model because all of our SaaS services we've looked at require us to land our sensitive data in their cloud, which our security team does not like. Is there an option with your solution where we can keep the data internally and you help manage it? Yeah. So in essence, what our platform does is help you manage um, your deployment, right? So you are actually deploying yourself into the, in this case, it sounds like a cloud environment, it could be on-prem as well. Um, and your data is your data. It's not our data. We're not in the middle of your data. We're not you know, managing your data. We're just managing the infrastructure and the technology itself to make sure that it's healthy and available and working for you. So the short answer is yes, um, we we absolutely support that model. This is not a situation where we ha even have a cloud. That's not a thing for us. Uh, we only deploy into the ma major cloud providers or your own on-prem data center. Um, and in fact, if you do it in the cloud, you can actually do it under your own account so that if you've made a commitment to the hyperscaler and you have to spend a certain amount of money, you know, you want to buy the infrastructure under that umbrella so you get credit for it. And in fact, we can even transact for our services through the marketplace as well. So you can get credit for that spend with the cloud provider as well. So very long answer to a to a, a good question, but the short answer is yes. You keep your data and you deploy it and we just help you manage the technology. Great. Mark, that one is done. Okay, another question here. Uh, you talked a little bit about how security and compliance is a challenge. What security parameters do you have in place with your offering? Yeah, look, there's a lot. Um, so what you'll see as you go to choose the individual technologies is you have choices about networking and security and, and different kinds of um, standards that you can apply to those environments depending on who you are. So, you know, a, an obvious example, certain regulations that you have to deal with. If you store credit card information, for example, you need to be PCI compliant you tick the box when you're deploying on our platform and then, you know, we can help you be compliant with that. Obviously that's not something we do for you. It's something we support you doing, but we have the right standards and documentation and processes in place to make that happen. And then other things, you know, you may want to use private links. You may want to go into, you know, IP addresses that are not available to the internet, but are private only. Uh, you may have different networking uh, capabilities that you want to do pairings, that sort of things. You know, we have a lot of those options. So the answer is our implementation of these technologies is sophisticated and meant for our enterprises to use at an enterprise level. Um, and we have a lot of those options and we can always dig in and figure out what you need. Yep. Sounds good. And I, I, I don't know if this is outside of the scope of the or the parameter of the question, but I think we're SOC 2 compliant as well, Dan. That's that's covered too. Great. Okay. Uh, I think we have one more question here. Uh, let's see. Did I lose it? Um, where did it go? Pardon me for one moment. Okay. Um, you had mentioned something about uh, NetApp storage. You're obviously part of NetApp. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your advantages on NetApp storage, if there are any? Yeah. Um, we are actually researching a lot of those things right now to figure out exactly where we are better together. Uh, the first one we brought to market is Postgres using Azure NetApp files. So that's obviously an Azure specific solution. 
Um, and you'll see a bunch more from us. Essentially, there are times when the value props of those two things and the way they perform together is truly different. And that's where you'll see us highlight. Obviously, you know, NetApp storage can be used with all of our solutions. You know, that's that's just general storage, right? right? But um, but there are specific cases where it's better and uh, and we will highlight those. And Postgres with ANF is a really good example of where it, it's at scale, it is blazingly fast. The fastest we've ever seen. Uh, I don't know if we know enough to say it's the fastest on the planet, but we haven't seen anything faster yet. Um, and so if you have a high throughput uh, need, that's a really good example of where uh, the power of NetApp storage and the Insta cluster uh, managed service capabilities together provide a fantastic solution. So yes, and more to come in that space. And I actually, I lied. There is one more question. We have a, uh, we have a major um, data migration project coming up. Um, it's on one of our open source technologies, specifically Cassandra. Is that something you can help us with? And have you done that in the past? Yes. Um, of course, we have to go figure out what migration means in this context, because that can mean different things to different people. But in short, yes. Um, so when we uh, go to our managed service with our customers, we do help them move things onto the platform. It's usually not that complicated. And in many cases, we can do it with zero downtime. Um, conceptually, you just start directing the data onto the platform and kind of drain one and hydrate the other. And, and there you are. Um, obviously, a little bit easier to say than to do, but we know how to do it. We've done it a lot at scale. Uh, so migrations are absolutely part of what we offer. Um, and in fact, are just part of the service. We don't, we don't typically charge separately if we're just putting it onto the platform. Uh, depending on what your needs are. We also have helped customers that are going from one cloud to another, from on-prem to the cloud or from the cloud to on-prem. So that portability is absolutely part of what we uh, we offer help with. And so, yeah, we have to dig in a little bit to what the specific migration yeah. is, but we typically help customers with that. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen cases where customers maybe get a better deal on one cloud provider than the other and they want to strike where the iron's hot to get, you know, just lower their cost. We've helped, I know we've helped with that. And I'll just throw out a shameless plug. I know we've done a, a blog or two around some of those data migration experiences that we've had in the past with customers. I know we did one for Cassandra. One was with uh, Kafka as well. So um, something, if, if you want to go to instacluster.com and check it out, that's that's available to you and just click on blogs and that should, uh, it's pretty easy to find. Um, I think that's it for the questions. I think we've, uh, wait, one more rolled in. I take it back. Uh, does your solution help in managing open source software's repositories as well? I mean, help them with the data market them for utility. I'm not sure I fully understand that question, Dan, but I'll let yeah. you try. <laughs> uh, so um, let me answer th this way. If you're using the managed service, and again, if we're not answering your question, please ask again or, yeah. or reach out to us. But if you're using the managed service, then we've automated all of the capabilities of downloading versions and managing versions. And for example, we do upgrades for you. So if there's a small upgrade, maybe there's a security vulnerability that needs to be patched, we're going to talk to you about when we're going to do that. But we're going to do it pretty quickly you know, for you. Uh, if you want to upgrade, then we're going to have more of a conversation about when you want to do that upgrade because we don't want to initiate an upgrade in the middle of your most critical business time or you know the, the wrong moment for you as a business in your business cycle. So we help you in the sense that we are literally managing the versions and, and the open source code that you are consuming and deploying for you. So yes, the managed service just take care of that. We don't, you know, manage GitHub for you, you know, in your account or something like that, because we're kind of uh, doing it at a higher level, right? We're just handling what you're deploying and how you're using it. So hopefully that answers the question, but if not, please feel free to ask again. Awesome. Um, I continue to uh, not be truthful here because questions continue to roll in. Sorry, Dan, we're putting you on the hot seat. Uh, another question here, it says, with the fall of Microsoft, users no longer want the cloud service. What are the alternatives? And I assume they're talking about the, the outage that happened uh, recently in the last few days. So I think that's yeah. what they mean by the fall of Microsoft there. Yeah, yeah, um, right. That it, it feels like a politically fraught question. Yes, that's a <laughs> little bit. Right, so um, as we said, right, our our um, 
service is focused on using these technologies and where you do it is sort of secondary to us. So if, for example, you were using it in any cloud and you thought, you know, the cloud has some risks that at this moment I'm not willing to take, or I feel like I could have a better alternative, maybe on-prem, um, we could absolutely help you move that on-prem. That's that's something we do and pardon me, know how to do and have done very large migrations, you know, back and forth. Um, it's also true that you might say, you know, I feel more comfortable in a different cloud. And so you could go cloud to cloud and we, we certainly help with those as well. Um, but these are not options that we provide. I mean, we have the expertise to help you move stuff around to, to exercise that portability. There's nothing special about what we do because we're not selling any proprietary code or proprietary um, technologies. So it's just the fact that all of these open source technologies can be run in lots of different places, clouds on-prem, et cetera, and we can help you move them around if that's how your requirement changes over time. So again, hopefully that answers, but the short answer is you pick where, we'll help you get there. Okay, one more, I promise. Um, and I don't know, there's some acronyms here that I'm not familiar with, Dan, so um, we might have to do some research on this one, but I'll ask you anyway. It says, does your solution produce NTIA compliant SBOMs? I don't know if that's SBOMs. Um, I don't know either. <laughs> okay. okay. We'll have to research that. Uh, we've got that that question logged in the queue. So we'll do a little research on that one and, and get back to the the person that that, that asked us about that one. Yep. yep. That's I it. That's, yep. Sorry, good. Oh no. That that's the last question. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. So with that said, I'll I'll kick it back over to Candace to close us out. Thank you so much, Dan and Michael, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.